you know, calling them careerists or saying they're infected with the leprosy of a royal court or, you know, whatever today's rhetorical trope happens to be. Now, look, remember what I told you about Francis, the savvy politician. He knows this reaction is out there over time. He is going to do what he can to try to bring these folks along. Okay, proof of the point would be his recent outreach to an Italian uh, traditionalist by the name of uh, Mauro uh, Palmore. Did you all hear this story? Palmore is a very well-known traditionalist, uh, some would say arch-conservative Catholic uh, in Italy. Not quite a, a Latin mass Lefebvreite guy, but sort of, you know, on that side of the street. Uh, back in September, he did a piece for one of the big papers in Italy called uh, Il Folio. The headline of which was Perché questo Papa non ci piace, which means why we don't like this pope. You can't argue that he was pulling his punches, right? I mean, it was truth in advertising. I kind of laid out, you know, a traditionalist critique of some of the things that Francis had said and done. Flash forward to December. Palmora was in the hospital with a respiratory illness. Francis calls him on the phone. Oh, and by the way, Fran this is something Francis has become infamous for doing. You know, in Italy, he's known as the cold call pope because he is forever calling people up he hasn't met before to have a chat. This has become so common that the Italian version of John Stewart, that is the guy who does the kind of fake comedy news show at night, did a piece uh, about 10 etiquette tips, what to do when the Pope calls. <laughs> and this is how ubiquitous a phenomenon this has become. My favorite was the last one. He said, if the Pope is going on a little bit, don't be the one to say you have to get off the phone. Okay? Let, let him finish the conversation. And if your friends or family complain about how long you were on the phone, go over to them and say, oh, by the way, um, the vicar of Christ on earth and the successor of Peter says hello. Uh, so what's for dinner? Right? Anyway, he makes one of these cold calls to Paul Martin, uh, and he says, oh, look, I, I heard that you were in the hospital. I want you to know that I'm praying for you, and I'm going to remember you in my mass. Uh, and Paul Martin says, well, that's incredibly meaningful, Holy Father, especially because of what I wrote about you back in September, and, and Bergoglio doesn't even let him finish the sentence. He says, no, 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 no. He said, I, I read that, and I know you wrote it with love, and these were things I needed to hear. Okay? So this is a pope who, over time, is going to do everything he can to try to promote unity rather than division. Final thought I want to leave you with is I think there is something we all can do to help him in that endeavor. Okay, that is promote a unified response to the Francis effect, the Francis phenomenon. Let me preface this with an empirical observation. Okay? Whether you are on the most enthusiastic end of the spectrum in terms of response to Francis or the most ambivalent, I think the empirically undeniable fact uh, is that this pope has captured the world's imagination and that because of that, people are taking a new and often more sympathetic look at the Catholic Church. And we're talking about people who, in many cases, had tuned out the Catholic Church or reached conclusions about it a long time ago, who are, because of the ferment around this man, open, uh, at least potentially, to taking a new look. Now, as I said at the beginning, the question is now that they're taking that fresh look, what are they going to see? And let me give you two plausible trajectories in terms of what they might see. Okay? One is they might see a debating society in which people are constantly at one another's throats, arguing over the precise doctrinal valence of every last participle that flows out of the Pope's mouth. Okay? community that is determined to feed this energy being created by Francis to the same sausage grinder of tribal combat uh, that we seem to feed everything else. There's an old joke, I don't know if you've heard of it, it goes like this, there's a dad in his living room, okay, watching a football game, and he hears a ruckus upstairs. So he goes upstairs and he sees the kids in a circle on folding chairs, just screaming their lungs at each other, okay, saying, you're an idiot, and they're saying, no, you're completely wrong and I can prove it, and so on. And the dad says, what in the world is going on in here? And one of the kids looks up and says, I oh, don't worry, Dad. We're just playing church. <laughs> the joke stings a little bit, doesn't it? Because there's, there's more than an element of truth about it. I mean, you know, because religion is about, are about people's deepest passions, you know, uh, sometimes we have a special genius for creating division where it doesn't need to exist, okay? So one trajectory with Francis is that we could play church with the new pope. Okay, feed it into the same pre-existing divisions and, and therefore squander the momentum. Okay. 
Now, the other plausible trajectory uh, is that when people look at us, what they could see is a community that is genuinely striving to overcome its differences, genuinely striving to realize that iconic vision the Pope has laid before us of the Catholic Church as the field hospital in which the wounds of a broken world are cured. Now, you know, it's up to you, but I would submit that the second is by far the more attractive missionary and evangelical option. Okay? So, let me end with something practical, a practical invitation to help us realize that second option. Okay? Listen, I know Lent is over, but I'm going to help you get a jump start on Lent 2015. Okay, by giving you some early Lenten discipline you can, uh, you can gear up for. Let me speak first to those of you in this, uh, with us here tonight who would be on the most enthusiastic end of the spectrum in terms of reaction to Francis, just wildly pumped up about what you're seeing from the new Pope. Here's the piece of Lenten discipline I would like to invite you to. Please resist the temptation to use the Pope as a club to beat up on other people in the church you don't like. Okay, that is to say, if you've got a bishop you think is a troglodyte, you've got a pastor you think is a clericalist jerk, there's some other outfit in the church you think hasn't yet gotten the memo, whatever it is, Resist the temptation to run up at them, waving a picture of the Pope in their face and screaming, why can't you be more like him? Okay? It's not going to help. It's going to be counterproductive. It's going to turn the Pope into an agent of division rather than a point of unity. Ladies and gentlemen, for the sake of God, give it up for Lent. Okay. Now, let me speak to those of you on the most ambivalent end of the spectrum, who perhaps worry that we might be running the risk of throwing the baby out with the bathwater uh, in the Francis area. Here's the Lenten discipline I'd like to invite you to. And I know this is a deeply countercultural claim in the America of the early 21st century, but I swear to God it's true. Folks, you do not have to have an opinion about something five seconds after it happened. Okay? Sit with what you're hearing from the Pope and what you're seeing from the Pope. Meditate over it. Pray over it. As the Gospel is saying, Mary did with Jesus, ponder these things in your heart. Okay? If you do that, I guarantee you're going to be surprised and consoled about where things are going. So, concretely, here's what I'd like to urge you to avoid. When you say something from the Pope that you find a little puzzling or alarming, or what is more likely to be the case, when you see somebody else in Catholic life whose opinions you don't share celebrating whatever the Pope is doing, okay, please resist the temptation to immediately run to your computer terminal and post an angry blog about it someplace. Okay. Once again, I guarantee you it's going to be counterproductive, it's not going to help, it's going to turn the point of the Pope into a point of division rather than a point of unity. For the love of God, for the holy angels and saints, and the spirits of new saints, John the 23rd and John Paul II, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for lit. Because if we can do that, that is, if we can take advantage of the new missionary opportunity that Francis has created, if we can project a unified response, summoning the best of ourselves to construct this field hospital and to fling open its, its doors to a world that is desperately in need of healing and recovery, if we can do those things, then ladies and gentlemen, we have a winning strategy for new evangelization in the early 21st century, every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Thank you, God bless you, God bless this parish, and viva il Papa. American television where absolute ignorance is never a bar to talking about anything. And, and I see no reason why it should be here tonight. Now the, the warning is uh, that the good people of this parish have asked me to sit here and parley with you for a while whether you have questions or not. So if you don't come up with questions, I am simply going to tell you more Pope jokes. And I promise you this is not a consolation devoutly to be wished. Example, Pope walks into a bar without a frog on his shoulder. Bartender looks up and says, Hey, that's kind of cool. Where'd you get it? And the frog says, Wait a sideways. But up the road. You see what I'm talking about? So let's have questions.
Uh, well, is my hiring by the globe part of the Francis effect? Was that the first part of your question? Uh, well, to some extent, I think the answer to that is yes. Now, I mean, it's also part of a kind of broader vision that, that John Henry, the new owner of the Globe, has for uh, the, the future of major American daily newspapers. I mean, he sees them as uh, a kind of constellation of special interests. Uh, and you kind of look around in your market and figure out, you know, what are the interests to in which you could appeal. And clearly, uh, both in Boston and nationally and internationally, the Catholic thing is awfully big. You know, I mean, Catholics are 40% of the population in Boston. They're a quarter of the percent of the population in the United States. Uh, and, you know, there are 1.2 billion Catholics around the world. I mean, you, you get even a share of that. Uh, and you're talking some fairly big numbers. So I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer the question of whether this would have happened before, you know, with or without Francis. What I can tell you uh, is that having a pope who is, you know, also the unquestioned new rock star of our times, you know, clearly from a media point of view, helps. Actually, I mean, part of me is a little nostalgic for the pre-Francis period because there were whole months where I could kind of be a specialist, you know, writing for an insider audience. And there was, there was time to relax and calm down and towel off. You know, with this pope, it's prime time all the time. I mean, CNN, for God's sake, is turning into Vatican TV. We cover everything the pope does. You know, I mean, honestly, if I called a producer in Atlanta tomorrow and said, I can get you in to, tell, to film the pope opening his mail, I guarantee you he would be here. You know? Uh, now, uh, the other part of the question uh, about uh, is Francis at risk? One thing I should tell you is one of the things you need to understand, some of the things that Francis is doing are first, that is, they haven't been done before, okay? Some of them are things that many popes have done before. You've simply never heard about them because we haven't been covering the pope for a long time in the same way that we're covering the pope now, uh, Pope Francis. I certainly, you know, standing up to the grip of the mafia in certain sectors of Italian society is something that is a crusade that popes have been involved with and identified with for a long time. I mean, I covered John Paul Stanis' trip to Sicily in 1992, you know, when he stood in the neighborhood of Brancaccio in Palermo, which had been Father Polizzi's neighborhood, you know, and wagged his finger uh, and talked about, you know, and you could just see the rage in his face. Uh, at Mafia Dawns, who tried to sprinkle holy water over their criminal activity by showing up for the, the, you know, the processions to the Virgin Mary and giving money to their local parish and so on. Uh, and Benedict, too, said similar things. So in, in that, I don't think Francis's language about the Mafia puts him at any greater risk than any recent pope has faced. Um, now, that said, I, I, one thing I can tell you uh, is that having covered trips of popes and uh, of, of presidents and prime ministers, okay, com covering, c comparing that to popes, the security membrane around a pope is just incredibly thin. Okay, you know, when the president of the United States flies, he flies in his own plane, and, you know, there's this foulness of, ar you know, armor-plated SUVs and a whole army of Secret Service personnel and so forth to travel with him. Pope doesn't move around with anything like that. Uh, and, you know, this is one part, uh, I think, theology, that is, you know, popes ultimately believe that their destiny is in the hands of God. Uh, I think it's one part pastoral instinct. They don't want to be cut off from people any more than they absolutely have to. But in any event, just as an observation, I will say to you uh, that the striking thing is not that the pope is at risk. I think that every time the pope is in public, he is in, at risk in a degree that surpasses any other public figure I can name. Uh, I, I think for perhaps the surprising thing is that that risk doesn't become real you know, more often than it does. You know? Yes, ma'am. God bless you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just going to blow past the surreality of that question. And the sort of theological conundrum it beckons, uh, and, and say this. I mean, first of all, um, obviously one of the hallmarks of, uh, of of the Catholic Church since the Second Vatican Council, that I think, will accelerate on Francis's watch, uh, is the ecumenical project, the press for Christian unity. Uh, and, and Francis, I think, is committed to that uh, both personally and theologically. I mean, the personal dimension is that when he was in Buenos Aires, uh, he was, by his own request, he received a mandate from the Holy See to be the point person in Latin America for relations with the Eastern Orthodox uh, churches. 
Uh, and he also had remarkably good relations with leaders of local evangelical and Pentecostal communities, which, as you know, are mushrooming all, all across Latin America and have been for a generation.